if you have a team of individuals that's ambitious. It doesn't matter if their ambition is to eventually be a competitor or whatever. The time that they're going to be with you, whether that's a year, whether that's five years, you're going to see fantastic results in your company because all your ambitions are aligned. I would rather work with and have a team that's ambitious instead of a team that doesn't communicate well because they don't trust each other and they're working in sort of different directions. Hey folks, Todd DeWalt here from Construction Leading Edge. We've got the team together and we're going to be talking about one of the most powerful books I've ever read that changed the way that I coach, the way I parent, the way I sell, the way I negotiate. I mean, it's The title was a little corny that I thought at first, but I'm really glad I read the book. So we're going to get into that in just a minute. But first, let let's uh, we've got Leah and Manish here from the Construction Leading Edge team. Um, I'm going to let you guys introduce yourself. Talk a little bit about your background for folks who are listening in for the first time. Tell us a little bit about your your background and what you do here at Construction Leading Edge. Um, let's go ladies first. How about you, Leah? All right. Thank you. So my name is Leah Hostetter. Uh, I'm still getting used to that. Just recently got married. Um, my background, I've been in the industry really my whole life. My dad's a contractor, so grew up on a job site. And then after college, got some big girl job and uh, working for some production builders. So worked for some of the big guys uh, and was in that for several years and was focused on, uh, excuse me, customer experience and training and development and joined Todd's team about a year and a half ago. And now I'm the director of customer success and loving working with all of our clients and helping them to get great results. Excellent. Excellent. A big girl job. I like that. I'm not sure if I've had my first big girl job (laughs) yet or not. Maybe that's still in my future. We'll see. Um, Manish, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background and and, uh, what you do here. All right. My name is Monish Cartier. Uh, I'm from Brisbane, Australia, and I've been in construction for about 18 years now. I got into it right after high school, started with labouring. I'm a carpenter and I worked my way up. Um, I did construction management at uni, used to be a commercial project manager, uh, and my wife Michelle and I used to have our own um, remodelling business in Brisbane for a few years there um, quite successfully and for the last year, just over a year now, I've been uh, a part of the Construction Leading Edge team coaching um, other businesses on how to improve their profitability, how to reduce their time involved in the business and free up a lot of their time to do other things with their lives um, and you know how to enjoy their lives a bit better as well. And I'm really enjoying it and right now um, along with my wife and our little toddler. We're doing a three-month trip off the States um, and (laughs) loving the heat, loving all the food. And yeah, that's me. Yeah. So you're in um, New Orleans right now and making your way across the South and we'll be, I guess we'll all be together in November for our our live meetup in Naples, Florida that's coming up soon. So looking forward to it. So I, I appreciate the work you guys do. I know our clients do. Um, we get nothing but positive feedback. So I'm excited about the impact that you folks are having and really appreciative of, of what you two are doing for our team. So I'm excited to, about what we're going to get into today. So the book, now uh, this actually started, we had our first book report when Manish assigned a book report basically to us a couple of months ago. That was 10X is easier than 2X, the book. Manish was like, you guys got to read this book. I think we should talk about it on the podcast. So we did that. If you want to check that book report, the very first ever book report episode, it's somewhere on the Construction Leading Edge podcast. This book is Instant Influence by Dr. Michael Pantalon. And I heard about this years and years ago. And again, it's it's dramatically changed the way that I parent, the way I negotiate, the way I coach, the way I sell, probably the way I get myself to do things. So we're going to talk about all of that, um, a lot of that before we're done today. So we'll talk about, we'll start with some guiding principles. We're going to get into this concept of psychological reactance. We'll talk about the power of autonomy, and then we'll get into some practical situations. We're going to brainstorm a situation as a group and how you can use these principles. Because one of the things that we do a lot here is we help construction businesses put systems in place 
which requires change. And it re requires people to change. So the, the title is Instant Influence. The subtitle is How to Get Anyone to Do Anything Fast. So I've heard that good leadership is um, getting people to do something because they want to. And uh, we're going to talk about how, do you, how you can actually motivate people. So if you're, if you're struggling with, like, how do I motivate my team to do stuff? How do I get them to change? How do I get my people to embrace this new process? You're going to learn some pretty powerful principles here that could be the answer to that question. You could be looking at it all wrong. So there are three guiding principles in this book that I want to start with. And I'll just read an excerpt from this and we'll, we'll start digging into it. So the three guiding principles, instant influence is based on three principles. Number one, you may want to write these down if you're listening. Number one, no one absolutely has to do anything. The choice is always yours. No one absolutely has to do anything. The choice is always yours. Number two, everyone already has enough motivation. They have all the motivation they need. Number three, focusing on any tiny bit of motivation works much better than asking about resistance. So no one absolutely has to do anything. The choice is always yours. Number two, everyone already has enough motivation. And number three, focusing on any tiny bit of motivation works much better than asking about resistance. So the first principle that no one absolutely has to do anything, the choice is always yours, is a response to the law of psychological reactance. And when I read this, the lights went on. And I realized, oh, wow, I was inadvertently banging my head up against this law of psychological reactance as a project manager, Back when I managed projects, when I would try to sell to customers, when I would try to get my kids to do stuff, when I would try to get my wife to do stuff, um, I realized, oh, this is, this is why I could never get anybody to do anything because of psychological reactance. So I'll just read this. The law of psychological reactance says that if someone tells you to do something, you probably won't feel like doing it, even if you might otherwise have wanted to. This was widely studied by Jack and Sharon Brim since the 60s, and this law has long been the bane of managers, healthcare professionals, and parents. In fact, the harder the other person tries to get you to do something, the more he yells at you, insists, threatens you with dire consequences, the less you're going to want to do it, and the less likely you are actually to do it. So if you think about what's our typical management approach? Um, how do we approach change? How do we approach leadership? How do we approach bad behavior? Mm, it sounds a lot like yelling, insisting, threatening with their consequences. And it just doesn't work. So I want to, I'll ask you guys to answer this question. Let's talk about how does psychological reactance get in the way of leaders and business owners? What do you guys think? I mean, are there some examples that come to mind? Have you seen this out in the wild? Um, how does psychological reactants get in the way? What do you think, uh, Manish? I think, um, you know, ironically, when you asked us to do this book review, I was like, I don't really want to read this book. I've got a whole <laughs> list of books I want to get through myself. But, you know, it's reading this book was actually quite eye opening for me personally, because I feel I definitely have that psychological reactance especially when my wife asked me to do things as well. And so it's opened my eyes up to, you know, why that's potentially happening. And I'll certainly be using a lot of these systems myself or these principles myself in the future moving forward. But it's also resonated with me having been an employer, having been a project manager and trying to get, you know, my employees or colleagues or team members to do things my way because I'm getting them to kind of see it from my perspective hasn't really worked. And one of the big things with psychological re um, reactance is the, there's no, there's not enough freedom or there's the idea that there's not enough freedom, which is why instantly people are like, I don't really want to do this. You know, this guy's trying to get me to do it his way. I'd rather do it my way or I'd rather do something else. And it, it comes in play when like contractors, right, trying to get you your, guys to do daily logs, trying to get them to plan the day ahead, trying to get them to stay organized and, um, you know, put in change orders and things like that. If the system's set up in a way that works 
for you as the owner of the business without them seeing what's in it for them. They probably can't relate that freedom, whether that's freedom of time or freedom of choice that they've got to do it. And so they usually tend to just skip over it. And, you know, what do we do when that happens? Like you were saying, it's about, hey, I need you to do this. You know, you start yelling at them and you're like, there's, I've, I've had chats with plenty of people, including myself, who have gone, you know, if I could just clone myself, I'd have a team of people who do everything my way, which, you know, obviously is impossible. And I'd probably have a team of employees that I won't get along with if I just clone myself anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they won't do anything anyway. So that's how I've seen it come into the wild and, and across my experiences. I don't know, what do you think, Leah? Yeah, you know, I think we, it's just human nature. <laughs> I think there's varying levels of resistance with each human, right? Some people are more apt to be like, okay, I'll do what we say. Other people are going to fight against it no matter what, like tooth and nail. But regardless, there's going to be a level of resistance. And even if someone's a, like gives in to what you may want them to do, not only is there going to be a resistance level, but then there's also going to be a resentment. <laughs> and so I think this is what's really important about this right here is realizing people need to come up with their own reason why they're going to do something. And that's what good leaders do is they help those around them figure out why is this important to you? What is your why? Uh, and without that, I think uh, it, you're just constantly pushing against something. You're battling something. You're pushing a wet noodle uphill. <laughs> it's just not going to get anywhere. Uh, and that's what I really liked about this because I'm probably on the lesser side of those who resist things. I, I tend to fall in line a little bit more so. I'm more of a rule follower. But there's definitely that level of resentment when I do something that I don't want to do that I'm told I have to do versus me finding out why that makes sense for me and why that might be a good thing. So you're on the lower end I feel like I'm I'm probably toward the upper end of this, and Manish, I'm pretty sure you're on the upper end of this spectrum as well. Uh, so let's talk about marriage, right? So I've been married 26 years now. Uh, Leah, you have a few months under your belt, and Manish, how long have you been married? Seven, seven years, I think. Okay, so. I have found this is probably, we don't get into marriage a lot, but um, this really shows up a lot. So if you're married, you may want to listen to this. This concept is probably, at the, it's at the root of a lot of um, the trouble I get into, the, the problems I cause. Because my nature is if somebody tells me I should do something, especially my wife, Lori, fortunately, Lori doesn't listen to this podcast, so... But if she tells me to do something, or I should do something, or I, I think what it is with psychological reactants is we as humans don't like to have options taken away from us. So when we feel like our options are taken away, we feel like we're losing freedom, we're losing autonomy, we unconsciously resist it. So even when it's something I know I need to do and it's the right thing, it's like, well, you know what, I didn't really like the way she put that. So for some reason, I am reluctant to do that. And has that ever, does that ever rear its head with you, Banish? Or is, am I the only one? All the time. All the time. And I've, <laughs> the, the book was, you know, again, it, it helped me kind of investigate that a little bit further as to why. Why do I put up that psychological reactance? And I think it's, a lot of it's to do with things, again, freedom, like me just doing it when I'm ready to do it and the way I want to do it. And some of, you know, I'll give you, using marriage as an example, everyone does their share of household chores, right? Like when it comes to the backyard and stuff, that's my territory and I do it my way. Michelle doesn't really care about it, so, you know, I enjoy it. Whereas if there's something to do in the house and she asks me to do it because she's too busy or whatever, I'm like, oh... I don't really want to do it, so I'm just going to wait till <laughs> the last minute and I'll just do it my way and it'll probably upset her a bit, but it's fine because it's done. But, you know, I, I probably need to change that attitude, to be honest, and I'm glad Michelle does listen to this podcast, but not as frequently as she used to. <laughs> but on the flip side, like in the business, you know, another thing I've recognised through reading this book is there's there has been times where my employees have brought up ideas to me. And my psychological reactance to that, unfortunately, 
built up a barrier until the point where we did the nailed handoff session and opened it up. But, you know, for the guys that are listening, I'm sure you're aware too, there's, there's probably employees that have ideas, have suggestions on how to improve the business, and it may seem like, no, 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 I don't want to do it their way. It needs to be done my way, sort of thing. And you put up these walls, and it kind of, it really prevents these guys from taking ownership of the solutions, taking ownership of the problems and, and the process to solve those problems as well. And probably a bit more accountability if they come up with things themselves. Yeah. I, I want to talk about that for a few minutes. How does, how does the psychological reactance cause problems? Because I, I think entrepreneurs probably have a, they value freedom, put a, a high value on freedom. Therefore probably have a, on average, have a higher psychological reactance than the average bear. So this is a good, great example. One of the things I've, I've seen when I talk to a, a partner in a, a company, they're a, a business partner in a company and, and they want to systematize their business and they want to work with us. I'll tell them, all right, this, this is great. You're on the right track, but uh, um, if you go to your partner or if it's a multi-generational business, and if you go to your father or go to your mother and you tell them, we need to do this, here's why the chances of them doing it go down dramatically because of psychological reactions. Simply because you, the way you approach it, if you go to somebody, if you approach an entrepreneur and say, you need to do this and here's why, shields up, they'll find every reason not to do it. And this this causes a lot of problems for us. I, I think it's probably one of the reasons why a lot of construction businesses don't have good systems in place. They don't have good financials in place because everybody's telling them, you need to get your financials in order. You need to do this. And they react negatively and to say, I don't need to know that bullshit. You know, I'm not a numbers guy. And um, so the more you tell somebody they need to do something, and to your point, I'm glad you brought that up, Manish, when, when your team comes to you and says, hey, I think we need to do this, this psychological reactance will throw up this wall and get in your way. It could be a fantastic idea, but if you're if you're letting this get in the way, then it's going to cause some real problems for you. And let's say you have a rock star on your team and they bring good ideas to you, but you shoot them down because they're not your idea. What's going to happen? That person is eventually going to quit bringing ideas or quit altogether. So this this psychological reactance it. Knowing about it, I think, requires requires some high emotional intelligence because you have to be able to examine your thoughts and think, why am I being, why am I reacting to this? Why this this makes perfect sense, but why am I procrastinating it or why am I resisting it? It's like, ah, it's because of this deep down psychological nature of mine that's that's getting in the way. So it's a it's a huge deal. Think about kids. What's what's the first word most kids learn? No, no, no. I don't want to do that. No. And if you, if the best way to get a kid to ensure a kid doesn't do something is to tell them exactly what to do and how to do it. So sometimes it's not just telling them what to do. Like with your team, it's not just telling them what to do. But if you tell them how to do it, this is why micromanagement is so detrimental. Is because it engages psychological reactants from your team and virtually eliminates the possibility of your team taking ownership, things happening. So you really have to be aware of psychological reactants. The, the next thing that is a big topic in the book is the topic of autonomy, giving people autonomy, the ability to control their destiny, to control how they go about doing things. And when we say Autonomy, we're not talking about this complete freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want. But there is a, a level of autonomy that that we need to provide teams. So let's talk about that. Here's the question. Why is it important to provide autonomy to your team? And then how do you how do you practically provide autonomy? Maybe even how do you build autonomy into your your systems or your business? Leah, what do you think? Why is it important? I think that that's a <laughs> why is is kind of a key word in all of this, really. What's the why behind it? But um, I believe the reason why autonomy is so important is because of that psychological reactance. Uh, so helping your team to recognize, hey, 
You have autonomy here. You get to choose. Ultimately, the decision is yours. That's really an important part of this. It doesn't mean that they get to choose the consequences. None of us really get to choose the consequences necessarily of what our decisions are and the choices that we make, but allowing people that freedom to say, you get to make this decision. This is up to you what you want to do. That's powerful. That changes things significantly. Whereas I think if you go in and say, you have to do this, you should do this, threatening to do this, all the things that we just talked about, there's that immediate level of resistance. Like you said, the walls go up and no matter what it is, even if it is the right decision to make, and you even know that you're not going to do it. But if someone comes to you and says, Hey, Leah, you get to make this decision. Here are the consequences. Here's what may or may not happen depending on what you choose, but it's your choice. More than likely, I'm probably going to choose the right decision anyways, the thing that someone may have come to me asking me to do. But the difference is I now have that freedom. And I think that's an important part and something that we really focus on in this program. Um, I know especially Manish and I as coaches, we often have answers that are maybe the right answer for our clients, but we rarely just tell them. (laughs) Uh, That's a good part of being a coach is you ask a lot of questions and you allow your client, you allow whoever it is that you're speaking with to come to the conclusion that makes sense for them. And, you know, sometimes the answer that I thought was the right answer for my client isn't actually the right answer. And it's through that uh, process of allowing them to have the autonomy, to allow them to have the decisions to make those choices, asking good questions. They land on a decision. They land on an answer that's right for them. Um, and I, I, that's just so important. I think it really points back to that psychological reactance. If we can allow that autonomy, people are more than likely going to make the right decision anyways. It's just that difference of you telling them versus asking them. So practically speaking, one of the ways you can build autonomy in is instead of telling people what to do, you can ask questions and help people come to that conclusion. So coach them instead of, of, uh, directing them, being the the dictator, Mm -hmm. telling people what to do. How can somebody build autonomy into their, their business so that it's sort of systematic? What do you think? I think this points back to trust. I think that's a big part of this is trusting your team that they know what they're doing. Uh, One of the things that we do in this program is guiding your team to create your internal processes. We give you the guidance on how that works. And what Manish and I are often sharing with our specific clients is let the person on your team who's actually going to do that part of the process, let them come up with that. That's a level of, of autonomy. It, and I think that's one of those practical answers to that is if they're the ones actually doing this day in and day out, let them come up with the solution for it. And by the way, if it doesn't work, that's okay. They get to go back and find another solution. There's a big difference between that and you dictating what that solution is or dictating what that process is. So I think that's one way that you can build autonomy into your system is first starting with that level of trust and then turning it over to your team and saying, hey, what makes sense? What's going to work here for you? Yeah, that is a that's a big myth that I, I think we've uncovered. There's a belief pattern that a lot of our clients have. They're a visionary CEO. They they want to operate in the visionary role, which and they understand if I'm going to scale my business, I have to have systems and processes in place. Yes, I want it. But then they recognize that they hate developing systems and processes. They suck at it. They don't have the focus, the detailed attention to stick with it, but they think they have to do it. So they're, they, they're just this tortured genius. Who's like, ah, I'm a visionary CEO, but I'll just never have these systems because I have to do it. I have to do it all myself. And what we found is that's not true. You can be the visionary and task and delegate to your team and say, Hey, we need systems and you're the right person to build it because you're the one who's going to actually run it. So that's when I've seen the light go on for a lot of people. So I'm really, really glad you brought that up. Manish, what about you? Why is it important to provide autonomy? And then how, how do you build that into your systems? What do you think? If you ask yourself, what, what is the business, right? It's, it's not a bunch of documents with your CPA or or with the with the board or whatever it's really just a collaboration or a collection of people and although you can account for yourself as the leader you're not it right you're not the business so a lot of business owners will get their identities 
mixed up with their businesses and feel like the business is an extension of themselves. Everything has to be done their way for it to be successful. But it's actually the opposite. For the business to be successful, you need to define what that success means for each individual that's part of the business. And, you know, your goals and dreams might be one thing, but theirs might be completely different. And when you sort of open up those questions with your team and ask them, what is it that they want to achieve in their lives? And how can the business and our clients and everything help them get there? You'll find out that people are way happier by just doing their jobs and succeeding the way they'd like to do them, right? Because everyone has a different personality, everyone has different quirks, things that work for them, things that don't. And one of the things that I did with our employees was was ask them, what do we actually specialise in as a business? And what is our niche? And you could talk about, you know, we build really quality homes and, and all that sort of stuff, but there's the, I think you've mentioned on this podcast before, the five whys, the questioning yourself why, 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 and going further and deeper. And what we ended up coming to as a team was that we really just want to improve people's environments while providing a stress-free experience throughout the build. And and the stress-free experience, if you really reflect on it, it's not just the client, but also my employees, my subcontractors, everyone else involved in the build. And then we question back from that and we go, all right, how do we create that stress-free experience? And that's when the team started suggesting, you know, let's let's do our daily logs this way. Let's plan our days this way and things like that. And it was little things that made their lives and their jobs easier. But they were also thinking about how, how to improve the experience for the clients and my colleagues and my subcontractors. And it resulted in everyone just being happier at the end of the day. And just allowing them to set those standards gave them the autonomy to actually take ownership of the entire process, right? And it led to just everyone down the chain being a lot happier as well. So it's how you how you build that into your systems is what I heard you say was get your team involved in looking at the big picture. What are we doing? Where are we headed? Why do we do what we do? Help them articulate that. And then once they're clear on what they're doing and maybe it's why you're doing it. Maybe the the question is, why are we doing this? Are we just putting up sticks and bricks? Are we just turning money over? Um, Why are we doing this? And once you get clear on that, then people understand, ah, well, this thing that we need to do is in support of that vision. And that's when people are clear People, we all do our best work when we're clear on why we do it. And I think that's exactly. what gets missed a lot is we're trying to, sh- I grew up on a farm and I've spent some time with actually going to builders offices, spending time with their team. And they may not have grown up on a farm, but I think they would be great um, veterinarians because they're really good. They would be really good at giving cows pills because if you've never given a cow a pill, the process is, put them in this head gate in a chute. And then you, you have this long pill pusher because cows have really long throats and the pills are really large, by the way, you grab the cow by the upper lip and you shove this pill pusher down their throat. And then you stick the pill in and then you hold their mouth shut until they swallow it. And there's no glass of water. There's no scratch on the head or anything. It's just very transactional. And that's how a lot of people go about trying to implement change with their team. I I went to one builder's office to spend two days with them to do a deep dive. And as I was walking out to, to meet with his team, I said, by the way, what, uh, what did you tell your team about what we're doing over the next couple of days? And he kind of dropped his head and he's like, well, I, I sent out a, a calendar invite that said mandatory consultant training. And I was like, Oh boy, here we go. So I, they thought I was, they didn't know that, but it was mandatory consultant training. And all they knew was they had to listen to this guy for the next two days. And it was basically, I'm going to shove this down your throat and you're going to swallow it and you're going to take it. And this may not, not surprisingly, there was a lot of psychological reactants going on there. And once we got past that and got the team involved and why are we doing this, how are we going to do it? Then the implementation just took care of itself. 
Yeah. So uh, another, as I think about how do we bake this in, how do you build autonomy in? I, I think about it from you know, one of the things we do with our clients is help them design their organization for the future and have a clearly defined accountability chart that delegates outcomes. And when you delegate outcomes and delegate results to somebody, in essence, you're giving them autonomy. You're you're systematically providing autonomy. You're saying, hey, these are your outcomes that you need to deliver. How you get there, you've got some latitude to do that. So we're, we're going to define the what and the why and then give our team some some latitude on how they, they get there. And I think that's a great – when people start to do that is when they, they really start to see their team take ownership and uh, – and really shine. I, I might add just quickly to that as well. Yeah. Uh, in terms, once you've set that accountability chart and you're showing your team, you know, what the growth plan is for the business as well. And like you said, splitting up those lanes and exactly what each individual and in their role needs to succeed. A couple of things. First of all, you need to step back and stop being the project manager or the estimator or, you know, like, if, if your problem right now is that you're wearing multiple hats, stop wearing them and just trust your team to do it right. And if you're making them accountable for the results, you should allow them the freedom of figuring out how to get to those results. And sometimes that's by trial and error, but that's okay because you're not doing that job. They are, right? You, you can't be the best project manager, the best estimator, the best superintendent, all these things at once and also run a business. It's just simply not possible. And you know what? It's not possible to always hire the best at all times as well. It's just not going to happen. But you can develop the best for your company by giving them autonomy. And as an example, when I did this exercise with my team, you know, I had a plan to continue hiring more people as I needed to. But productivity just got a lot more efficient because everyone was just doing things. And and my, my staff started seeing how the system's working for them as well. And it got to a point where I was about to hire a new carpenter to add to our crew. And my crew was like, we don't need another guy. Like Mm. we, you know, we forecasted the next couple of months. And to be honest, like there's no point having someone else. We're good. And it saved me a hire. It saved me hiring someone and then, you know, trying to get more work to keep them busy and things like that. So I was quite happy with that. And when your team tells you something, you just go, yep, no worries. You guys tell me when you're ready and I can look for someone then. Yeah. So if you're, if you're wondering, uh, you know, what's the business case for letting go and all this, you know, this stuff sounds kind of fluffy, trust and autonomy. And, you know, we, I've heard people say, you got a rule with an iron fist. Like, well, maybe that worked in the fifties. I don't think it worked that well. Because human nature hasn't really changed that much. So the business case for this is when you embrace autonomy, when you get your team involved, help them find their own motivation. Because remember, everybody has all the motivation they need. Your job is to help them find it. Your team is more productive. Engagement goes up, which would probably lead to higher retention, lower turnover, more profits. You become the employer of choice, better culture. You start attracting people. Good people tend to know other good people, and those people tend to follow each other around. So there is a business case for this, and we've seen it over and over again with our clients. Yeah. So, Manish, I want to talk about your – I think – I don't think. I am certain after seeing employee performance review systems for 25 years – the one you used with your team was the best that, that I've ever seen. So, and I think it was the best because it leveraged some of these principles. So can you talk about how you did employee reviews? Because it was, I would describe it as being upside down from the way most people do it. Walk through your employee review process and let's, let's see which of these principles it may have leveraged. So I created that review process based on my experience as being an employee and, you know, being a visionary in the far end of that spectrum, I probably wasn't the best employee in the regard that I just wanted to do things my way and didn't want to conform as such. But when I did the employee review system, I understood, you know, one of the other really good books that I've read 
is how to win friends and influence people. And one of the principles that kind of overlaps with this book in there is kind of looking for what's in it for the other person. I didn't want the performance review to be a bashing exercise and say, you know, you're not good enough, you're not doing this well enough, and I need you to do these things to get better and, and all that sort of thing. So <clears throat> I decided to flip it over and I introduced KPIs, so the big five as we call it, right at the beginning when I hired people and I showed them the exact tools and resources they need in the company to actually be successful in that role. Then I allowed them to rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 on how they think they're performing. And I wouldn't agree or disagree with that rating, right? It was, it was their choice. That's how they saw themselves. And, and, you know, the guys are quite honest, like in certain things, they'd give themselves fives or sixes and go, yep, I know I need to, I need to improve. Um, I'm just going to try harder. And I said, well, instead of trying harder, what can I do to help? What is, what is some things that we can fix in the system to help you guys? And that process allowed us to make our system more efficient because the guys would bring up things that, that I hadn't even considered. I'd seen from their perspective. And we'd improve little things, you know, like how our daily logs are worded, how our crew planners are worded, <clears throat> the type of clients that we're saying yes to because, you know, it makes a pretty big difference on site and the type of work that we're taking on as well. And... Me going through that process with the guys helped them understand <clears throat> exactly what they need to do to get to a 10 out of 10, right? And, and that did happen over the next few reviews. You could see these guys improving because they, they knew exactly what they needed to do. And because they were their ideas, they actually had the motivation to do that. They wanted to improve just because they wanted to improve. There was, there was no emphasis on, hey, you need to get better for me. They just want to do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And the next part of the equation, I asked them on what the company needs to improve on as a whole. You know, what, what should I be doing better in my job as the CEO and, and for Michelle and things like that as well. And when they had feedback, we took it on board and we just said, right, we're going to trial this out. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, you tell me what else we could be doing better. And there were, you know, really small things as well, like on site when we have our waste bins the size and the type of waste bins we get to make things more efficient and, and cleaning equipment, things that I don't really even think about unless I'm a laborer on site. It was quite refreshing to hear that from the guys. And you could see me just going, yep, yep, you can go and buy this specialised tool. Let's, let's go and do it. How much that improved our productivity and how much it improved our profitability as well. And it's not like we were overcharging. We were just charging the same thing. And then the next part of the review process was doing S-M-A-R-T, so smart goal setting with the guys. And this is something that I wish my employers did when I was younger. And I sat down with the guys and said, hey, let's bring out your professional and personal goals, priority one, priority two, priority three. And I want to find out what we can do or what I can do specifically to help you guys achieve those goals. And for most of these guys, those goals were to buy a house, to, you know, get a promotion to, to kind of move up the ladder further, um, to get better with personal finances and things like that. And having done those things myself, I was able to give them you know, ideas of setting your budget, how you can actually get to a point where you're buying a house where you know, a couple of our guys did buy a house as well. And it was quite rewarding for me to see as well. And what that allowed both myself and them to do was see what their personal goals are, see what they actually want in their lives and how that's linked to how they're performing at work mm. and how work can be a, a source of personal gratification, uh, gratification and satisfaction for them as well. And that way I didn't have to motivate them, I didn't have to criticise them, <clears throat> I didn't have to force them to do anything that they didn't want to do. They could link what they want and how they can get there to it themselves. And eventually we got to a point where I was sitting down with them and they were just rating themselves at 10s. And I'd go, yep, I agree. I'm, I'm not seeing anything wrong. And, you know, likewise, they'd be rating the business and myself at 10s and going, and they'd say how much happier they are because things are just running smoother. And, you know, things just worked well. It was a well oiled machine. Yeah, I love that. I love the fact that you started with what's it's their why 
they had some long-term goals that seemed to be disconnected from their job. And some people would say, you know what? It's not my job to, I, I can't be concerned about everybody's life goals and whether they want to buy a house and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, you're right. You don't have to be again. You have that choice. But if you, if you really want to have an engaged team and you want to lead people well, help them articulate their vision. Why are you doing this? You know, what's, what is your, what's your long range goal? You want to buy a house? Okay. What's it going to take to do that? You want to be prepared to have kids. You want to be a project manager. You want to take my job someday. Great. Let's, why do you want to do that? And then how can we connect your, what you're doing today and this week and next month to that? And I think the big flip there, the upside down part of that is instead of performance review being about the owner or the boss's motivation and what the boss wants you to do, you flipped it over and it's, all right, what do you want? And then I'm going to help support you as the leader. I'm going to help you get there. I'm going to coach you through that. These are your goals. This is what you said you want to do. How can we help do that? And uh, we've said the word, a very important word here a couple of times, which is trust. And when people feel trusted and they trust their employer and they trust their team, motivation goes high, productivity goes up, culture goes up, all sorts of things go up as opposed to being in a low trust environment. All of those things tend to, to flatline. So yeah, I, I, I love the way you approached performance reviews and I would encourage everybody to, to, uh, to jump on that bandwagon. Definitely. And just to add to that as well, you've got to remember that these, they're just people like yourself, you know, they, it's, I think in the corporate world, they do this a lot better for whatever reason in construction, it's kind of like farming, you know, a lot of, a lot of employees are treated like cattle. It's just like, you just come in and you have to do things my way. And if you can't do that, you're out of the business sort of thing, which I think is a completely wrong approach. When, when you find out what people's goals are, like I'm completely transparent with my employees, right? And I tell them what I want, what I want the company to get to. And let's figure out what, what the gap is and let's bridge that gap. Mm-hmm. And if, if my guys eventually want their own businesses or want to grow further and then go work for a bigger company, I'm okay with it because, you know, what, what's going to be the net result if you have a team of individuals that's ambitious? It doesn't matter if their ambition is to eventually be a competitor or whatever. The, the time that they're going to be with you, whether that's a year, whether that's five years, you're going to see fantastic results in your company because all your ambitions are aligned. I would rather work with and have a team that's ambitious instead of a team that doesn't communicate well because they don't trust each other and they're working in sort of different directions because they don't know exactly where everyone wants to go together. And, you know, it's always when you have, when you have a team that wants to grow, collectively the business is going to grow there's there's no way that it won't right so it's just about finding out that balance and yeah we keep talking about trust and you just have to trust you can't force people to work for you forever you just have to accept that and people move unfortunately sometimes due to life circumstances and and things happen but you know you can't just keep thinking about those sorts of things you have to look at the positives yeah definitely good stuff all right let's let's talk about a real life experience example. Let's talk about how we can use the instant influence principles to solve a real world problem. So there are quite a few examples, but um, here's one that I hear periodically. that's very painful, causes lots of problems for companies. And it usually sounds something like this. My project managers or my superintendents, my lead, my field leads, are not following our change order process. So they're doing work and not documenting it, waiting until the end to submit change orders. And then the customer's unhappy. We end up eating costs. We have all this chaos, punch lists are a nightmare. So we end up with profit bleeds and chaos. Let's talk about, uh, here's what, what I'll do is I'll share how I've seen it, how I've seen people do it uh, that doesn't work. Um, and then let's talk about how can we use some of these instant influence principles with our, let's say it's project managers. How do we get them to 
follow the change order process. So that change order process should be somebody requests work that's not in the contract. We get a signed change order and we follow our process. We get the signed change order. Maybe even get paid for it before we do the first bit of work. That's, that's the policy. So what doesn't work is having mandatory consultant trainings and jamming it down their throat, sending out ambiguous emails, putting people on blast. Hey guys, stop doing this. If, if you are trying to solve this by using the words stop, don't, it's not going to work. Pulling people in and threatening them with consequences. Seems like the right thing to do, but it doesn't work. Telling people if like, hey, you need to do this, follow our process, pointing to the process, telling them, maybe even threatening them, if you keep doing this, you're going to get fired, right? Seems like the right thing to do, but it doesn't work. So those things don't work very well. If they would, if they did work, we would probably teach people to do that, but they just don't. So how, how should they do it? Let's say you guys are coaching me. I'm the business owner and I'm saying, Manish, Leah, I have, I have four or five project managers on my team and this happens all the time. We have a process in place, but they just won't follow it. What should I do? Leah, what advice would you give me? I think uh, it would start with a lot of questions, honestly. You know, I would want to understand how is that message being relayed? Um, not saying that this person is doing this, but the command and demand way of doing things, it, it doesn't work. <laughs> you just explained why that doesn't work. And I think we all understand that from the psychological reaction, reactant, reactants. But the, I think the follow up question is whose process is this? Who created the process? How was your team trained on this process? You know, these are some of the questions that I would ask to understand what the situation is and what the scenario is. And I know we haven't gone into the, all the steps of what instant influence entails, but the next question would be talk to your team, ask them, why might you do this? That's a big word that we hear a lot in this book is why might you do it? Or, you know, the, just asking the questions as to why would this be a benefit to you? That restores that autonomy. So I think it's kind of twofold. It's it's number one, how, or excuse me, who's created the process? Is your team involved in this? Are you giving them that autonomy to be a part of creating something that they are actually going to follow? And then why might they do it? Have them consider that. What are the reasons why this would be a good thing for them? Um, I think those are a couple of the questions I know I have asked clients and that um, I will continue to ask them because I think it's really powerful. And I want to loop back to just a couple of things in the previous conversations we've been having, going all the way back to a visionary, because I know a lot of our clients, a lot of people listening, you are visionaries, you're, you're business owners, you're CEOs. And at first glance, something like this might feel a little bit threatening in some way. However, it almost seems like this perfect marriage between a visionary and getting results that you want. If you open up your vision to your team and then say, how are we going to get there? and giving them the autonomy to do so, then that allows you some of those, uh, the luxuries of trusting your team, of being able to delegate and seeing some of those results that follow because of it. I know that was a long-winded question, but ultimately I think it comes down to, is your team involved in creating this? Are you giving, the, giving them the autonomy to do this? And then why might they do it? Finding out from them, what's their why? Yeah. So those questions like, why might it be a good idea to process change orders. Um, so ask some questions. Some other good questions to ask would be, hey, what sort of problems is this causing you? How is this making your life difficult? How does it feel when you have to have a conversation with a client at the end? What bothers you about that? And then why might you want to change? What? And then, yeah, I think it's, you're exactly right. Get them involved in developing the process instead of trying to cram the current process down their throat to get them involved in, in their process. Good stuff. Uh, Manish, what about you? What, um, what advice would you give me if I'm trying to get my project managers to follow the process? Well, so I've been, I've been a PM. I've been a commercial PM. And I absolutely hate change orders because it just disrupts my schedule. It disrupts my budgets and, and how, you know, if I'm running multiple projects especially – how we're planning on doing things. So I would ask you, if you're the business owner, why do you have so many change orders? And 
I would encourage you to ask your project managers, guys, no one wants to do change orders. What do we need to do to either avoid our change orders or minimise them completely? Mm. Because in my experience, most change orders rise due to pre-construction not being done properly. Things just haven't been thought through. Uh, They've been missed by either your estimator, they've been missed by the client, they've been missed by the designers, right? So as a PM, that you lose your freedom of choice because you now have have to process this change order. You have to have those conversations with the clients that, hey, this is going to cost extra. This is going to do this, this is going to do that. And sometimes it's just easier to avoid it, right? So I would encourage business owners to go, instead of me banging my head on the wall and trying to force my PMs to process change orders, how can we just eliminate them? Mm -hmm. How can we eliminate that chaos? And the best way to think that through, again, is to use your team. So I'd encourage them to say to their PMs, what can we do, guys? How can we improve pre-construction? What are the things that are slipping through the cracks? Yeah, that's, uh, sometimes we get blinders on and we get so focused on how can I, how do I get my people to follow this process? And that's sort of like saying, how can I get better at playing whack-a-mole when what you really want to do is let's eliminate the moles altogether and zoom out a little bit and say, instead of how can we get better at managing this chaos, how can we eliminate the chaos altogether and get the team together and ask those kind of questions. Why are we having all these change orders? And you mentioned the five whys method. Why is that happening? And then why is that happening? And what is, why is that happening? You'll get to some root causes. And then um, what do you guys think we could do? Well, if we did this, if we spent a little more time on the handoff, if somebody was focused on pre-construction, if we bought out our purchase orders in advance, and if we had all our trades selected, and if we had all of our selections made, we wouldn't have these allowance busts, which is where most of our change orders are coming from. I'm like, ah, instead of, then the conversation is instead of how do we enforce the policy, now we have a way of preventing problems and the team's bought into it. Yeah. I love that. Love that. And and that completely changes the problem because you go from your problem isn't that you've got project managers that aren't following through on change orders. Your problem is that you don't have the right process in place. Yeah. You know? Hard to probably admit to yourself that that's the actual problem, but you're trying to solve it in the completely wrong way. Yeah, that's I, I've seen this several times. A couple of our clients, when I first spoke with them, they would one of them in particular said. I, my superintendents need time management training. They need to get better at managing time. How can I help them manage time? So, well, what are they trouble, having trouble managing? And it's all this chaos because of the lack of pre-construction. So then they realized, ah, it's not time management. It's just that my superintendents have a lot of chaos and we need to solve that chaos. Another one that was indirect, I, I spoke with a few months ago, he said, we need help with with marketing. Like, really? Like we don't we don't do marketing. And as we dug into it, it became more clear that the problem was he had this roller coaster of a business. And the reason he had a roller coaster of a business was because when things were slow, he would put on his business development hat, go sell a bunch of work, and then put his project manager hat on and go execute on that work and then not do any marketing, and then he would get to the dip again. And the problem was he didn't have the right team in place. So many cases, you think the problem's over here, but it's actually in a completely different place. Yeah. Um, all right. A couple more questions here we want to talk about. Leah, this one's for you. Let's say one of your clients needs someone to somebody that's on their team to step up into a new role, take on more responsibilities. Maybe, yeah, just take on more responsibilities into a, a higher level role. How can, how can you use these instant influence principles to, to help that person step into that role and take on more responsibilities? What do you think? I want to go back to at least two of the first guiding principles, that they have the choice, they have the autonomy, and that they have the motivation intrinsically. So I think having that conversation, letting them know, You have the autonomy to make this decision. This is your decision. Can we explore the reasons why this might be a good decision? 
or it might be a bad decision. And so again, I think it's a lot of those why questions and why might you want to have this role? Why might you want to step up into this? Why might you want to do this or that or the other? It's a lot of questions and it's a lot of things that allow someone that you're talking to. I think this is the beauty of this whole process is you're getting someone to get out of their small mindedness. <laughs> We're all guilty of it, right? We come in with a conception or a preconception of something. If someone's asking someone to take on a different role with more responsibilities, they might already assume that it's going to be one way. And that's what I love about this is asking those questions and getting someone to think a little bit more outside of what they have come in with to consider, well, why might that be a good thing? Why might that benefit me? Why might I like taking on this different role here? And it opens up the mindset. I know there's a few stories in this book that they share about how people were able to come from one spot where they were stuck in one way of thinking about something and completely shifted simply by opening up their mind to something different. But this is also something that can be challenging without someone guiding you. And so I think that's what's what's a beauty with this. And so in this specific situation, it's asking those questions. Why might you want to take this role? Imagine six months from now, you've been in this role and you've been doing it. What would the results be? And why would that benefit you? Why might that be a good thing for you? You know, it's asking those questions, getting them thinking in a different way. Yeah. Focus on the future instead of focusing on the obstacles. One of the things I think a lot of people might focus on, I've probably been guilty of, is in this situation saying, all right, what do you need help with? Where do you feel like you're falling short? And that's kind of, that's that's helpful for training purposes, but I think it's much more helpful to do what you're saying is, what's in it for you to do this? How might you let your life be different? How is this going to help you achieve your goals? What goals will this help you achieve? So you're helping them look into the future and see the potential, which that's going to pull them through those obstacles. And it's going to answer the question, why should I learn this new stuff? And why should I deal with, get out of my comfort zone? Like, ah, because of these questions Leah just asked me, this is why I'm doing this. So helping people find, find their why. Yep. I love that. Um, I, there's one statement that I, that I've quoted over and over and over and over and over again from this book, which is people change when they hear themselves say why they want to. People change when they hear themselves say why they want to. So what you're saying is you're going to orchestrate a conversation where they hear themselves say, if they want to change, take on this new role and why they might want to find their own motivation. Yeah. Love it. Manish, different use case here. How might a contractor use these principles, these instant influence principles in their sales process? What do you think? So, okay, so if you look at clients um, and their decision-making, there's probably only two core types of clients. There's clients that make their decisions based on cost and clients that make their decisions based on value, right? Ideally, <laughs> you're mostly working with clients that make their decisions based on value, not on cost, because you can't really compare um, builders apples for apples because no one builds the exact same job at the same time. Right, So when you're talking to clients that make the decisions based on value and if you're showing them <clears throat> that you have a pre-construction process in place, you're showing them exactly how many decisions that they'll be needing to make during that process so that there's a schedule for it and you start on site and you finish by a certain date and probably be able to punch out a very detailed and accurate estimate based on those decisions. If you're able to show them, you can kind of use that um, instant influence system on them. You know, what is their motivation to actually make those decisions? Because as a lot of us have seen, oftentimes a lot of clients just stall on making decisions. And you, a lot of us end up with the whole just enough to start mentality where we go, okay, we'll just put in some PC sums or some prime sums uh, and allowances in our estimate. Let's just get this done. Let's just get started. And then we'll figure out which tiles and which fixtures and stuff. And that's how you end up with change orders, right? But if at the beginning you say to your clients, hey, if you guys make these decisions, I'll tell you exactly what this is going to cost, exactly when we can start on site, and exactly when we'll finish on site. And then you ask your clients, you know, do you see any value in this at all? Do you see any value in having that certainty instead of ending up with change orders and schedule overruns and 
basically chaos and overlap during the build. Yeah. So instead of looking at why it's what's in your best interest as the contractor, you're saying, hey, why might this be valuable for you? What's one of the, the, the questions in the get paid for estimates masterclass, if, if you want if you want to use this specifically to get paid for estimates, the question is, hey, at this point in the project, we have two options. We could give you a free estimate as a bunch of allowances and gaps, and then you'll write a big check, sign a big contract, and then we'll start figuring this stuff out. Option two is you sign a pre-construction services agreement. We'll put everything together. We'll plan out your project in great detail. You'll have full specs, selections, schedule. Um, so the question for you is, we have two options. When would you rather know what you're going to get and how much it's going to cost? Before you get started or in the middle? And they'll probably say, well, before we get started. And then you would say, well, why is that? Why would you want to know that before you get started? And then they're going to hear themselves say why they want to pay for pre-construction. So yeah, that's yeah, the good good stuff there. Um, so this works with negotiation. This works with uh, parenting. You can use... Instead of telling your kids what to do, you can, I use this stuff on my kids all the time. Like, hey, why do you think it's a good idea to do this? Uh, why do you think it's a good idea to go to class? Why do you think it's a good idea to uh, to clean your car? Um, that kind of thing. And they're on, to, they're on to some of my Jedi mind tricks, but they don't know all of them. So here's one piece of advice, okay? You can either share these strategies with your spouse or you can use these strategies on your spouse. Believe me, you don't want to do both because <laughs> I shared them with my wife and then I tried to use some of them on her and it didn't go that well. She said something to the effect of stop trying to use your psychological mumbo jumbo on me. So um, just a word to the wise. Uh, one, one use case here that, that I noticed after spending 25 years, 20, probably 20 years in the commercial construction space, I realized that most safety programs, most construction safety programs are diametrically opposed to well-understood psychological principles that are in instant influence. In other words, most safety programs are designed to fail because they're telling people what to do. They're telling, hey, you have to tie off. You have to wear safety glasses. You have to wear a hard hat. You have to do this. And instant influence tells us, according to the, the law of psychological reactants, when you tell someone to wear a hard hat or wear safety glasses or tie off above a certain level, you're actually making them less likely to do it. They're going to react. They're going to resist it. So I learned there are a couple of things that I learned on my very first project when I worked for a commercial general contractor, I had to constantly tell guys to wear a hard hat. I would tell them like, man, you got to put your hard hat on, put your hard hat on. I said it hundreds of times and I got sick of saying it. So finally I started asking them, I was like, Hey man, they didn't have their hard hat on. Like, Hey, uh, do you, are you planning on working on this site the rest of the day? This would be like at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning. They would say, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. That's great. If you want to work, on this site, you have to wear your hard hat. But if you don't want to wear a hard hat, you can go work somewhere else. Um, I'm not saying you have to wear a hard hat. If you don't want to wear a hard hat, you can go somewhere else and work. But if you want to stay here, you have to wear a hard hat. And that worked a whole lot better. And then I, I think about all the safety trainings I went through, and there was only one that I remember. And it was a safety training called Remember Charlie from 20 plus years ago. And this... The safety training was a lecture. It was a, a talk from a guy named Charlie who worked at a an, a chemical refinery, and he basically violated all of the safety rules, blew up half the refinery, and then he came back. He burned his body terribly, um, and it basically ruined his life. And he came back and became the safety director for this company, and then traveled around and did safety talks. And he talked about the impact. Uh, that it had on his life. Uh, obviously, his he talked about being burned, what that was like. Talked about how it uh, led to his divorce, basically ruined his life. One of his daughters uh, became severely depressed as a result, became suicidal, and he made it really clear: this is this is what this is the impact that your behavior has on your family. You may think it's about 
in his case, wearing the right safety equipment. But you have to understand safety is about for other people. So the, the, the take home, the only thing that they, that they did was they said, when you go home, here's our recommendation. Find a picture of somebody you love, your dog, your mom, your kid, and then stick that on the inside of your hard hat. That way, every time you put your hard hat on, you would see that, that picture. And that, that's your motivation. This is why you work safely. So I had a, a picture of our oldest daughter. She was just a baby at the time, and I taped that on the inside. And that was my motivation. That's why I worked safely. That was my reminder. Whenever I was tempted to want to be a cowboy and do something unsafe, Charlie helped me, that program helped me find my motivation for working safely. So I think it's very important to address, we're talking about life safety here. It's, it's important to use these these strategies in safety as well. So anything else? We've, we've talked about a few things. There's a lot of great stuff in this book. Is there anything else that you'd like to share about this book that was impactful for you that you think would be, uh, it would be a, we would be remiss not to talk about on this podcast episode. What about you, Leah? I'm just thinking of a story in here about a, a husband and wife team who he loved to camp and she hated it and she never wanted to go with him, but he really wanted her to experience that. And this really what he did is he used this with her to help her find her reason why she might want to go. And initially, because she loved him, she was giving answers that she thought he wanted. And he kept bringing it back to, no, not about me, not about what I want. What do you want? Why would this benefit you? Why would this be fun for you? And at the end of this conversation, he had her agree to go camping because he was going to cook for her. She was going to get to relax. She'd just get to have a nice fun weekend in a short distance from home. And it completely shifted that whole entire experience for both of them because he really honed in on why would you want to do this? And I think, you know, we've talked quite a bit about this, but I think that autonomy part is so important in this. If you think back on your life and, and the goals that you have accomplished, the big ones, the things that you've done that have not been easy for you, it's because you made a decision and it was something you genuinely wanted to do. And that is such an important part of this as leaders and as visionaries, getting our team to want to do something that might, might or might not be in line with what we want. But that, I think, is the missing link in all of this, is helping them to see that. And the other thing I liked about that, too, is it opened up a whole different world of possibilities for her that she had never even considered. <laughs> she was just adamant that, no, I'm never going hunt camping. That sounds terrible. And at the end of this, she was excited about it because of something new. And that's also what the autonomy does. I think if you allow people and you're asking those questions and they're thinking bigger than what they were initially, it brings uh, people to conclusions that they never even imagined or considered. And I think that's a benefit, especially in the workplace for our teams. They're going to come up with great ideas that we never even thought of. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It, by using these principles, you help people disassemble the walls that they've built around themselves that they think they don't like, or they can't do, or they don't have what it takes, which that's great leadership. That's a big part of leadership is helping people believe something is possible and then see something they didn't see before. Yeah. Great stuff. What about you, Manish? Is there anything else that was impactful for you that we, you'd like to talk about? I think similar to Leah, uh, using, using the systems on or the principles on, upon yourselves, but also, you know, outside of <clears throat> just think of it in business terms. Cause one of the examples that the author shared in the book is how he used it on his father who was a lifelong smoker and it helped him quit smoking. So if, if you've got certain bad habits personally that impact your business, you know, I'd highly recommend using the system on yourself. It's a, it's a good system to kind of think things through and unlock that psychological reactance and get through to the other side. So yeah, I'd encourage everyone to use it on themselves as well. Yeah. Yeah. Great stuff. There's a, uh, obviously read the entire book, but if you want to skim the book, there is a, a script basically you can use step-by-step -step script of questions that you can use to help people. How you can basically, as the title says, how you can get people to do how to get anyone to do anything fast. So check it out. Instant influence by Michael Pantalon. He is a psycholog psychologist and research scientist from the Yale school of medicine. And what's interesting about, 
like the whole premise of this book is he was tasked to come up with a system that emergency room doctors could use to help people who had a substance abuse problem change their behavior. And they had like seven minutes to do it. So if this system will work for people who have a substance abuse problem, who are in the emergency room, change their life, it might help you get your people to follow a change order policy. And it might actually help you get out of your own way as well. So check it out. All right, Leah, Manish, thanks so much, not only for sharing on this podcast, but also uh, more importantly for all the the great work you guys are doing for our clients. And uh, we're going to let you guys go and, and get back to it. Thank you so much. Would you like to have a customized blueprint of the five-piece bridge that you can follow to systematize your construction business? Would you like to learn how the 300 plus construction business owners we've worked with are systematizing their business, reducing their stress, sleeping better at night, all the while working less? Well, if that sounds good, then the first step is to apply for your free business evaluation call over at constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply. Or you can just go to our website, constructionleadingedge.com and click on the apply now button again. So to get your free customized blueprints of what the five piece bridge to systematize your business looks like for your business, you can do that by scheduling a free business evaluation call over at constructionleadingedge.com forward slash apply. A-P-P-L-Y. Be advised, we only offer a very limited number of customized blueprints each month, so go book your call today. Thanks so much for listening or watching. If um, Wherever you're at, if, if you're watching on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts, be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss anything. Also, be sure to check out some of the 300-plus other episodes we have out there. And if you would... You can take a, a moment and leave a rating and a review on the platform that you're listening. That would mean a great deal to me. It also helps get the word out there and uh, spread it to other folks. If you could share this episode with somebody who might need to help it or might need to hear it, they might appreciate that as well. Hey, my name is Todd from ConstructionLeadingEdge.com. Thanks so much for listening. I'll see you next time.